about today. Um, this, this event has been eight months in, plan, in planning, and uh, I thank you all for coming today. Um, I just want to make some specific thank yous uh, for certain people that have helped plan this event. Uh, to Henry Butler, who without uh, his guidance on this, we would not be here today. <laughs> Uh, to Paige Butler, Jeff Smith, Mary Jones, and the rest of the LEC staff, thank you very much. Um, to Professor Todd Zywicki, is he here today? I hope he's here today. There he is. <laughs> thank you to Professor. Yeah. Professor Kobayashi as well, who has been very instrumental in planning this event. Um, to the journal editors, uh, specifically Sarah Vernon, who's helped me so much on this event. And to the journal staff as well, who are here today. Um, to the school administration, Dean Polsby, who couldn't be here, Carol Armstrong, Dana Fallon as well. And also to the Federalist Society, uh, we thank you <coughs> for being, a, being present here as well. Um, like I said, this event has been eight months in planning. Um, I, uh, back in March, actually March 8th, eight months to the day, I uh, sent an email to Professor Zywicki asking him uh, if he had any symposium ideas. Uh, I had just come on the job as a symposium editor, and uh, we were looking for a, a good topic for our 10-year anniversary. This, this today is our 10-year anniversary. Um, and a uh, professor sent me an email back saying, what about doing a retrospective on three scholars that have recently passed away? And gosh, has it been a, a tough year for long economics, but we look forward, we look forward, and um, in looking back over our ten years as a journal, uh, there's really no other fitting topic uh, for us to put forward today than this, and uh, a special thank you to everyone who's been working planning this event. Um, I, I hope all of you enjoy uh, our speakers today. Uh, so just a quick word on the journal. We were founded, as I said, in 2003, 10 years ago. Um, our journal was started by a few entrepreneurs, uh, a few 2L students here at Mason, who wanted to create a journal that would bring students together for a general topic, law and economics. And the journal started as a gateway for those students to create a product for professionals um, to to write, to discuss uh, the general theme of law and economics. And at the time, the <coughs> journal was the first student-run peer-reviewed journal. I don't know if that's still true, but uh, the first peer-reviewed student-run journal. We send all of our articles to a peer review before being published uh, in the symposium as well as a process, a peer review process. Um, Ten years later, we're still going strong. We have 39 members, we have 13 editors, um, we publish four issues a year, uh, we've been doing that since 2009, we do three issues, articles, and the symposium issue, which uh, our panelists have written papers for, that will be published next summer. So we're going strong, hopefully another 10 years, and hopefully we'll be back here in this place another 10 years from now. Um, just uh, some administrative points. This event is approved for CLE credit. Uh, so if you're an attorney in the house and you'd like to um, sign up for CLE, we have three credits uh, approved as of a couple days ago. Um, and you can talk to JLF staff outside during the breaks about CLE. Um, also, we're looking for um, new subscribers as well. If you're interested in subscribing to the Journal of Law Economics Policy, we have information outside as well during breaks. Um, and in closing, uh, I hope you enjoy this program. Uh, we put together a pretty outstanding panel of guests today. And um, in looking back, uh, James Buchanan was a member of our board of advisors. Um, and we, we mourn his loss today. Uh, Ten years ago, we put together an outstanding board of advisors to lead our journal forward. And uh, on that note, I am very pleased to announce our newest member of our board of advisors and the executive director of the Long Economic Center, Mr. Henry Butler. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the law school. 
Uh, it's, it's really uh, great to see so many uh, friends uh, come back for this uh, event. Uh, the Law and Economics Center will be celebrating its 40th anniversary next year, which is pretty amazing for any type of academic institution uh, to uh, uh, have, have lasted that long and to continue to flourish for so long. So uh, as, as part of our uh, recognition of the, the 40th anniversary, we're trying to compile all the, the archives of people who've attended LEC programs over the years. And um, yeah, fortunately, uh, Henry Manny was a pack rat, and we've got lots, <laughs> lots of material to go through. Fortunately and unfortunately, I guess. But uh, it's, it is, uh, it's very interesting to do that. And so, uh, just the other day, the, the uh, staff member who's in charge of this, uh, our archiving project uh, said, "You might find this interesting." And she handed to me. It wasn't an LEC program. It was the precursor of the LEC. It was the summer of 1971. Economic school. For law professors, that was the title. And I know that Armand Alshin spoke in that program, but the first attendee of law professors on there was Robert Bork. Right. So you've got this list. So this thing all pulls together pretty well in terms of the history of the center and people who've been involved with it over the years. Uh, the uh, and obviously law and economics is is the. Uh, is in the, firmly entrenched in the DNA of, of George Mason Law School, and, and a lot, of, and the center itself is a, is a big part of the school. Uh, we uh, have many of our faculty members are involved in our, our programs, and uh, but many of them also do not know the, the, the rich history uh, of the center. So, in some sense, uh, what we're doing today is talking about the history of the Law and Economics Center and the influence that uh, that these three great scholars had. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the great program. Uh, this is also the third annual Manny Law and Economics Conference. So it's certainly fitting that the moderator for the first panel is Henry Manny. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Henry. Unaccustomed as I am to moderating anything at George Mason Law School, I'm supposed to lie. <laughs> <laughs> Henry is certainly correct that uh, the LEC is inextricably tied with the history of this law school. Uh, the surprising thing is how the lives of the people we're here to celebrate uh, today are tied up with everyone in this room in just uh, an amazing fashion if you can trace it. And luckily I've survived long enough that much of it can be traced. Uh, <coughs> The, my connection with these three people is uh, quite interesting. Uh, one goes back all the way to law school. One of the very first people I met when I entered the University of Chicago Law School was Bob Bork. The law school was very small. My class, I think, was 68, the class ahead of me, which uh, uh, was still small from World War II, uh, was even smaller. Than uh, you know, like 150, 180 students in the whole school. And within <coughs> two weeks, you knew everyone. Uh, and, uh, Bob and I, uh, for whatever reason, uh, knew each other quite well, uh, casually. But then, <coughs> not long after I arrived, the Korean War started, and Bob disappeared. He was recalled back into the Marines and was gone for two years. And in my senior year, he came back. So that uh, his, uh, let's see, his, his and my third year in law school pretty much overlapped. Uh, we had classes together. But much more important than that, he and I were probably of the uh, 180 or so students by then. We may have been, uh, I wouldn't say the only two, but uh, of a very small group who had become very influenced by Aaron Director great economist who was in the law school at Chicago. Uh, and that gave us a kind of uh, collegiality uh, and set us apart from <coughs> most of the students. Most of the students were very upset by the uh, free market economics that uh, Aaron was, uh, was pushing. It was even more unpopular, if you can believe it, in those days than it is now. Uh, <coughs> at any rate, uh, I went off to a worthless year of graduate work at Yale, 
and uh, came back, was hired as the first uh, research assistant on the famous antitrust uh, project that Aaron was running at the University of Chicago. I had already gotten a commission in the Air Force and was told that I had six months <coughs> before they would call me to active duty. And uh, I told Aaron that, and that was fine. I started work, and one week later, literally, I got a telegram from the Air Force to report for active duty in 24 hours. Guess who got the position that I would had on the antitrust project? You got it, Bob Bork. Uh, <coughs> we had not much connection again for a number of years, but uh, we'll come back to that later. At any rate, um, not long after I started teaching, started at yeah, 56, I was invited to a small conference run by uh, something called Volcker Fund, which no longer existed. Uh, it, was a, it was a very, very nascent uh, free enterprise libertarian uh, outfit. The conference was run at, run at Claremont College. Uh, <clears throat> there were three speakers. One was Felix Morley, uh, brother of the New Deal, morally. Uh, the, another was uh, John Hicks, the great economist from Oxford. The third, I never heard of, Armin Alchin. And the very first day, the first lecture, Armin started and read uh, a piece and asked if anyone in the room had recognized it. And I was the only one who had because I, it was uh, from Human Action by von Mises. And that was the only useful part of my year at Yale. I had read uh, Mises and Hayek. Uh, at any rate, that very day, Armin and I were walking around on the campus at uh, Claremont College, and I started, he started explaining that lecture became the Economics of Property Rights, not published until 1965 <laughs> in Publico in Italy. Uh, and I said, you know, this sounds like what the legal scholars, the legal realists have been looking for. Something that would really explain why uh, <coughs> different rules of law have different consequences, uh, different uh, implications for the behavior of people, and so forth. I always say that that moment, Magyar, a light bulb went on, that was the moment in which law and economics was invented. And I claim to be the very first person in the world who ever uh, recognized that. But I said, Arvin, there's one thing you've got to do. Change the name from property rights, because that will confuse the lawyers terribly. They mean something very different by property rights than what you're referring to. He couldn't care less. Uh, property rights economics uh, survived very well. Uh, Arvin and I became close friends after that. We, saw each other several times a year, uh, or every year almost up until his death. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, year after that, because I was so taken with our, the year after that I taught the summer at UCLA and spent most of the summer talking to Armin. Uh, <clears throat> he was uh, then with Bill Meckling and some other notables at the Rand Corporation, along with someone else whom he introduced me to there, a man named Herman Kahn, uh, the, uh, the uh, prototype of the uh, Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> and Herman was one of the uh, fantastically brilliant guy. He founded the Hudson Institute. And in the summer of 62, uh, because I knew Herman, he had invited me to be a, a research assistant uh, at uh, Hudson Institute. I was in transit between uh, teaching at St. Louis University and going to GW. There was a, a young fellow there, a philosophy student from Columbia. I can't recall what his name was. And I was telling him about what seemed to me the relations between law and economics. We didn't have the phrase law and economics then. And he said, you know, it sounds a little bit like uh, a work you ought to take a look at. And I said, what? And he said, 
a book called Calculus of Consent. Uh, and it had been out then, literally, for two months. Uh, so it's very fresh. Uh, I got the book and I was blown away. I said, this, this really rounds out uh, what became law and economics. It's very important. And I said, the lawyers certainly ought to know about this. <clears throat> I had to twist arms, as uh, only a very junior professor can, in the law review at GW to get them to allow me to review that book. Uh, they, they didn't think anyone else would be interested. And that review that appears in the GW Law Review is literally the only book review of calculus of consent to appear in any law review in the United States. Uh, that tells you something about the level of intellectual uh, curiosity and, uh, <laughs> and scholarship in law circa 1962. When that came out, I sent a copy to uh, both Buchanan and Tulloch. They were in Charlottesville. Uh, I guess we had mutual friends, but I had never met them. I, within a matter of days, I had a telephone call from uh, Gordon inviting me to Charlottesville to give a paper, and uh, the rest was uh, more of my personal history of a long and very close association, uh, mainly with Gordon, but also very much with, uh, with Jim. That came back some years later, uh, <clears throat> after the, uh, I'd started the Law and Economics Center, first at Miami and then at Emory. Uh, I got a call from either Gordon or Jeff, I can't remember, I, I think it was Jeff, that he had been talking to, they, they had moved the Public Choice Center down to George Mason at that point. He'd been talking to the president, both Jim and Gordon were very close to and influential with George Johnson, who was president here then. And that uh, they wanted to know if I would be interested in being dean of the law school. Well, I, I didn't know anything. I'd never heard of the law school, didn't know they had one, but I found out very quickly that uh, there wasn't much. Uh, and I, I told me at the time, I said it was very doubtful that I'd ever take over the deanship of an existing law school because faculty would just ride me out of town in no time. They couldn't possibly tolerate what I would want to do. And <clears throat> Jim said, well, he, he understood that, but would I, be come, would I be willing to come down and consult with the president and tell him what he might do to have a better law school? Well, I did, and George Johnson was one hell of a salesman. Uh, <clears throat> he, uh, he convinced me but he dangled a lot of money in front of me, too. He convinced me that I could basically get rid of the existing faculty and start over. And that's what I did, and that's how we were able to introduce the ideas of, uh, of uh, what became what well, was already law and economics at that time uh, into the program that became this law school. In 1971, when I was uh, teaching at the University of Rochester and had, had planned the law school that eventually became the George Mason Law School, uh, <clears throat> to establish contact with uh, the law school world, uh, we decided, with the university's approval, that we would begin this program to teach economics in the summer to law professors. Uh, <clears throat> I guess the main thing motivating me at that point, uh, because at that point I'd suffered quite a few years of ridicule in the legal academic, and academic world uh, because of my interest in economics, and maybe particularly because of the kind of economics that I was interested in. Uh, but I, I still had great confidence that the stuff I had learned from Armin Alchon and particularly his uh, textbook, Statistical <coughs> Economics, really was going to be very important to, to law schools. At any rate, we started this program with Armin as the main lecturer. That was 74. I guess it still goes on 40 years later. Uh, for at least 25 years, 
Armin gave uh, over half the lectures in that program, as he did later in the program of <coughs> federal judges. So that uh, his, his influence on law and economics is gigantic uh, in, in many, di many different ways. Uh, when I started, when I came down and started the new law school, uh, <coughs> I made a yeah, I think social contact with uh, Bob Bork, and uh, he agreed that he would uh, join the faculty that I was assembling at that point. Uh, <clears throat> Buchanan and Tulloch, of course, were here and had their own public choice society, but the relations between the law school and the public choice center, uh, relations between the law school and the center were always very close. Only later that whole thing got tied up even more by uh, graduate economics and Mercatus moving down to Arlington. Well, that's the personal background of uh, this law school and of this celebration of three people uh, without whom none of you would be here. I would. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Henry, you're supposed to be the moderator and get the other speakers to speak. Oh, I moderate. Yeah. Uh, including, as it happens, Josh Wright, 
uh, who noted, citing Alchin, that to the extent that cognitive biases operate to deprive individuals of the ability to choose rationally, the firm and the market provide effective mechanisms to at least mitigate these biases when they reduce profits. But even more, uh, we make an additional point that Armin's uh, articles suggest not only that the market will tend to counteract behavioral biases and select for relative rationality and relative efficiency, but also that that means that even where we see apparent irrationality and inefficiency in the market, it too will often actually be rational and efficient. But these insights have implications for the debate over the usefulness of behavioral economics. Behavioral economists have criticized law and economics, alleging <coughs> that its proponents wrongly assume that individuals in the marketplace act rationally and in their self-interest, uh, uh, and, and impugn neoclassical economic analysis and, and law and economics as having little use in understanding the world and, and guiding policy. But Armin's simple insights suggest that while their premise might be right, their conclusions are all wrong. If Alchin is right, the evolutionary pressures he identified may lead to seemingly inefficient firms and other institutions uh, that, in actuality, operate to constrain the effects of bias by market participants. Ironically, the conclusion that inefficient or irrational structures are in fact, uh, excuse me, ironically, the conclusion that inefficient or irrational structures are in fact inefficient, uh, like, say, redundancies in decision-making that someone might claim are born out of an irrational risk aversion on the part of managers, often rests on an implicit assumption that the employees being managed are rational, and thus the redundancy is unnecessary. Uh, but if, as is more realistic, they suffer from various biases, then it may be that the first <coughs> operational redundancies are actually, actually an adaptation designed, or more likely happened upon by accident, to check the impact of those biases. Uh, it's not necessary for those who work within a firm to be rational in order for the firm to act as if it is rational. If true, behavioral economics might explain certain anomalies observed in the marketplace, but rather than implying market failures in need of corrective intervention, these insights might actually explain the sometimes curious institutions that have grown up around these anomalies as designed to ameliorate any inefficiencies that might arise as a result of them. So let me give just a couple of quick examples. Uh, in the, uh, uh, in the behavioral literature, uh, uh, of course, there is the uh, ever-present endowment effect. Um, but there's also literature in the behavioral literature that points out that the endowment effect is primarily a problem for sellers, not buyers. Uh, that it's primarily a problem only in thin markets without a lot of competing sellers uh, in the market. Um, and it applies more frequently, uh, or, or only, perhaps, when goods are purchased for resale rather than use. Uh, some behavioral theorists have described uh, the research making those findings, uh, led by uh, uh, Dan Kahneman, as uh, thus there's no endowment effect for the retail firm, only for the consumer purchasing the firm's goods. The implications of this finding are clear for predicting the organization of market activity. We should expect that an institution might arise whose primary comparative advantage would be that it doesn't suffer from an endowment effect as strongly as other institutions, perhaps by specializing in buying goods for reset. We might call this institution Walmart. Uh, and, uh, but, but essentially, any sort of middleman or intermediary of that type could serve the function of counterbalancing this bias of the endowment effect. Uh, another uh, example, uh, Levitt and Syverson have a famous paper demonstrating that real estate agents systematically uh, cheat their clients, selling their own houses for a higher price and keeping them on the market longer than those of their clients. And there's a puzzle about the persistence of real estate agents in the face of this bias. But it may not be so puzzling. Uh, Levitt and Syverson evaluated only completed sales in their analysis. They don't account for the possibility, for the possibly much larger deadweight loss from uncompleted sales that might occur in the absence of real estate agents who, whatever else they do, uh, certainly serve to mitigate some of the search costs in that market. In other words, real estate agents may appear to introduce inefficiency into housing markets, but conceived more broadly, they may in fact do the opposite. Lawyers, likewise, may serve a similar function in settlement negotiations if their clients suffer from biases that <coughs> cause them to overestimate the value of their claims at trial. <coughs> and uh, uh, it's frequently been noted, of course, that, that lawyers are a drain on society. 
Uh, Bob Rasmussen has made a series of, of uh, observations on the nature of bank lending operations to provide a, an exceptional example of how potential individual irrationalities might explain the organization of, of certain uh, structures in the firm. Uh, and although he doesn't cite Alchin, he, uh, he begins his, uh, his observations on this point with, with uh, language that comes right out of uh, uh, Armand's paper. Uh, he, he says, uh, uh, the imperative of competition gives firms an incentive to develop internal structures which may be effective at reducing or even eliminating at least some of the types of biases in decision making discovered by behavioral economy. Uh, so for example, banks will likely establish internal operating structures in order to avoid the distorting effects of persistent over-optimism bias among uh, their le lending officers. Uh, so, for example, so, in order to do this, they might use impersonal statistical devices, such as credit scores, to temper the overall optimism of any particular loan officer. In addition, if individuals suffer from a confirmation bias, loan officers who initially determine that a loan should be granted may tend to overweight subsequent confirmatory evidence and underweight new contrary evidence as it arises. Thus, there must be some sort of check to counteract these tendencies. Again, confirming the wisdom uh, of a loan by reference to a credit score may provide a reality check to offset these biases. There are lots of ways in which collecting credit scores and using credit scores may seem redundant uh, or wasteful or even harmful, less useful than, than loan officers. Um, uh, after all, a loan officer can collect more information from the borrower than a standard credit score can. Nevertheless, it might serve an additional, uh, perfectly rational function not exactly observed at first glance. So what about uh, behaviors that affirmatively harm consumers? Uh, uh, that is, those that earn positive profits not through marginal efficiency improvements, but rather through the systemic, systematic redistribution of rents and imposition of debt weight loss through anti-competitive conduct. Well, here, Armand's paper provides a, a, a really important insight into understanding how the antitrust laws can be enforced. Where alleged abuses are based on evidence of intent to abuse, because it's a practical matter, determining actual anti-competitive harm turns out to be pretty hard, Algin's article makes clear that there's no necessary connection between intent and outcome. Uh, as he notes, neither perfect knowledge of the past nor complete awareness of the current state of the arts gives sufficient foresight to indicate profitable action. The pervasive effects of uncertainty prevent the ascertainment of actions which are supposed to be optimal in achieving profits. But that must apply in spades, uh, for uh, uh, the ascertainment of actions which are supposed to be uh, uh, anti-competitive. In other words, while it's appropriate to model firms as if they are rational actors for analytical purposes, it is inappropriate to view them as intentional actors for purposes of assigning liability. And in a world of uncertainty, it seems likely that most efforts to monopolize will fail, just like most efforts simply to survive will fail. As Frank Easterbrook uh, wrote, citing Algin, wisdom lags far behind the market. It's useful for many purposes to think of market behavior as random. Firms try dozens of practices, most of them are flops, and the firms must try something else or disappear. <clears throat> Why do particular practices work? The firms that select these practices may or may not know what is special about them. They can describe what they do, but the why is more difficult. All right, well, something like 75% of firms fail. What fraction of firms that set out to exclude competitors succeed in doing so? Surely it's even less than 25%. Uh, any competitive outcomes are possible. The real issue here is uh, not that Algin undermines the logic of antitrust law. Rather, he undermines one of the most common bases for deciding whether to enforce it. Take, for example, the recent Google antitrust case. Although the FTC closed the case without taking action, listen to the commission's justification for doing so. This predates uh, Josh, so we can't play. <laughs> uh, to determine whether uh, Google violated Section 5, the Commission considered whether Google manipulated search algorithms and search results page in order to impede a competitive threat. Uh, a key issue for the Commission was to determine whether Google changed its search results primarily to exclude actual or potential competitors. The totality of the evidence indicates that Google adopted design changes that the Commission investigated to improve the quality of its search results. Frankly, this is absurd, but whether Google intended to inhibit competition or not is beside the point. And as Alton points out, almost impossible to connect with the actual, uh, with the actuality, if it exists, of any competitive harm. It just doesn't say anything about whether Google's conduct actually had any competitive effect. It's nice that the FTC decided to let them off anyway, but for the completely wrong reason. Uh, in a world of uncertainty, most efforts to monopolize will fail. Uh, 
um, and uh, in the valuable service of supporting those few innovations and the firms that implement them that succeed, regulators should limit enforcement actions to those few cases where actual observed effects indicate a problem, not where evidence exists that some ununderstandable practice, in Coase's words, was intended to have any competitive effect. Alchin provides all the intellectual basis needed to draw that conclusion. I have two more minutes? Great, I can now. I can stop now or go on forever. <laughs> um, all right, well, let me, let me make one uh, final point um, that is building on what I just said. Uh, one of the implications of that, of course, is that there's, a, there's something of a competition between the market and, and regulation of the market. And um, uh, Alchin's paper uh, provides a, a sort of an important uh, way to understand why we might expect, as, as is well accepted uh, for reasons that Jim Buchanan and others developed, that, that regulators uh, are plagued with certain biases and that there doesn't exist the same kind of system that would uh, naturally serve to ultimately weed out those biases and ensure that the political system is as rational as the market. Uh, and so as a general matter, in addition to the specific points I was making about antitrust, uh, there, there's a, a real concern, of course, with, um, uh, with government regulation of these uh, market structures, particularly when, as I pointed out, there are lots of instances where certain behaviors and certain organization, or organizational structures will seem irrational, um, but may actually be uh, sort of sub rosa solutions to the very biases that are plaguing the regulators who are purporting to regulate those structures. change in the order that uh, the agenda shows, because the uh, next paper is really in the proper place. Fred McChesney reviewing several works in my knowledge. Thanks, Henry. Uh, I will be relatively brief uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, my paper is itself relatively brief. Uh, and secondly, it's uh, I took advantage of the invitation uh, to be here to uh, put together something rather personal in that it, it recounts uh, experiences that I had with Arm and Alchie and what they have meant to me. Um, I would like to think that uh, this is of, of some value uh, to the world at large because there is a theme running through it and that is Arm and Alchie as a teacher. Uh, which we all know uh, was a very big part of his life, but it's a little bit harder to, to document it as compared to his substantive contributions, such as the one that, that Jeff was just talking about. And I uh, wanted to at least try to uh, put a little bit of that down on paper as, as I knew it. Now, uh, what did I know and how did I know it? Uh, I was not uh, a graduate student of, of Arm and Alchin's, although I was fortunate to be uh, the student of some of Arm's students, uh, a couple of whom at least are here today, Louis de Lussi and Don Martin. Uh, others who are not here, Ken Clarkson and so others. And I also had colleagues that had been colleagues of Arm's and very much bore the imprint of his influence uh, in what they carried on elsewhere, including working with me on various things, such as Dave Haddock. Uh, but again, I had no uh, direct contact with Armin as a graduate student or um, as a colleague. On the other hand, I had considerable contact with him uh, in, in other ways, and the paper talks about what those ways were, and again, back to my theme, how it is that it, they illustrate uh, what truly made Armin Elchin extraordinary as a teacher. And the, the first one that I'll mention here um, occurred at the Law and Economic Center at uh, Miami, University of Miami, where I was a, an Olin fellow at the time. And I had written a paper, which Henry Manny read, in which uh, I took issue with a very small and 
not very important part of a paper that Armand and Harold Benzitz had written in 19, or published in 1972 on why firms or how firms try to mitigate shirking. One of the devices being discussed by uh, Armand and Harold being profit sharing. Profit sharing is a way to mitigate shirking by increasing incentives that uh, workers have not to shirk because they're sharing in the profits. That's obvious. Uh, there's a, a brief part of that article that talks about how uh, Altrin and Nemsets believe that their model uh, explained profit sharing in law firms. And I disagreed with that little <coughs> implication of theirs. I had no quarrel with the overall notion of profit sharing as a device to mitigate shirking. Even if I had a quarrel, no one would have cared. I didn't have a doctorate got in. Uh, I was just a graduate student running around the Law and Economics Center. Who cares? Uh, but Henry read my paper, and it so happened that Armin was about to come down uh, to spend some time at the center, as he did quite frequently. Um, and Henry urged me to talk to Armin about this paper, in which I had this little disagreement that I just mentioned. Uh, and I first said, there's no way. There's no way I'm going to do this. Because Armin Alchin, he's a famous economist. I knew a lot of famous economists. I didn't know too many that didn't have pretty large egos. <laughs> um, and I didn't really wish uh, to uh, submit myself to that sort of a process. But Henry, as all of you who know Henry, to understand, Henry was not taking no for an answer, so uh, like, like a lamb to the slaughter, I thought, I set up some time to talk with Armin, and, whom I had never met, and who was not forewarned about this subject. And I walked in, I introduced myself, and I thanked him for taking the time, and I explained very briefly what my paper was about. And I guess Henry had told him that I was going to come and talk with him about a paper that had to do with Alshin and Debsitz and Sherpa. And Armin listened very carefully, very carefully, didn't interrupt, let me talk as long as I wanted to. And I finished, and I've never forgotten this. He sat there. He just sat there, looking off a little bit over my shoulder. Uh, and then he looked at me, he turned to me, and he said, you know, I don't know that Harold and I really knew all that much about law firms when we wrote that. Um, but what you're telling me, and the fact that I also actually had some empirics, uh, this is now 1976 or so, I had multiple regressions in my paper. And Bruce will be pleased to know that multiple regression in my case meant I had two independent variables. <laughs> <laughs> That's what made it multiple. <laughs> Forget two stages this, three stages that. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Good old fashioned OLS with two independent variables. Uh, and so he said, I don't think Harold and I really knew that much about law firms when we wrote this. What you're saying makes a lot of sense, makes a lot more sense. And we talked a little bit more about it. And I came out of the room, and I was stunned. The stars in my eyes. Uh, this, this truly great economist had taken all this time, but had been so kind, so desirous of learning himself and helping me to advance this. Well, I made several suggestions, and what have you. For him, it was a chance to, in effect, conduct a, a mini class there at the Law and Economic Center with one person. So it was a tutorial. Uh, but it was, Armin, it was Armin the teacher. And I went on to, uh, I sent the paper ultimately to Dick Posner, the Journal of Legal Studies, published it. It's the first thing of any, of any importance or consequence. I'm not sure actually it has any importance or consequence. <laughs> but it was, if anything, I did had any importance or consequence. That was the first. That was the first one. Yeah, I got a good story out of it. Absolutely. Uh, so here was this man who had been very helpful to me at a stage in my life when I was a nobody, and he was very much a somebody. And 
paper recounts how, as time went on, I would, I would see him at conferences. We would always sit down and talk. He was always the same wonderful, gracious person that he had been, never in a hurry. What was I doing? How, was, uh, how were things proceeding in my professional life, etc. Um, I used to, uh, Dave Haddock in particular, will remember all the times that he and I would, when uh, Armin came to the Emory now, Emory University Law and Economic Center, and we and you had the Economics Institutes for Judges, etc. And Dave and I would often go down and just sit in the back of the room when Armin was was teaching. We wanted to we wanted to uh, you know, get our get our pedagogic tune-ups by staying in touch with uh, with Armin through the years, and and we did. But the second uh, big aspect of the paper, the second personal story, if you will, uh, recounts how it was that uh, I worked with Armin to put together this thing that was published <coughs> in Economic Inquiry in 1996, his, uh, what he titled as the quote-unquote Principles of Professional Advancement, where he talks about the three articles that he considers his best, and he uses those to build, and here again, vintage Armin, to build five principles of professional advancement that he is urging upon newcomers to the profession. Think about these things as a way to, to do well and do good um, in this economics business. This all began with an idea that I had, and I pitched to economic inquiry. It's a long story. It's in the paper, but it's not important here. Uh, to uh, do a series of these kinds of things with a series of uh, sub-Nobel economists, uh, people like Armin Alchi, uh, Orly Ashenfelter, John McGee, uh, Arnold Harbour. I, I envisioned a whole series of these, and I was going to take the laboring war and work with the authors, but <coughs> do all the hard work uh, in terms of writing and what have you. They would just share with me, then I would write it up. Well, the series went nowhere. Economic Inquiry had no interest in my long-term series, but they were interested in the possibility of doing something with Arm. Um, and so I contacted him to see whether he'd be willing to do this. And I explained, I just need the input from you. I will, I will be responsible for the output. I'll do the typing. Uh, well, it began a wonderful collaboration. It lasted months and months, where he went back and forth, uh, and we put together this piece that you could you could read, uh, as I say, Economic Inquiry, 1996. But I talk in here, uh, and and I will close essentially with this, about three things that I found quite amazing uh, as I worked with Armour. Uh, emails, telephone calls, we, we were in very frequent contact in different ways, but oftentimes he would just send me things that he had typed out and would give them to me to, to build into the piece. <coughs> First thing that was really surprising to me was when he chose his three articles, they were the uh, evolution piece that Jeff was talking about, his piece on costs and outputs, which everyone is familiar with. And the third one was a piece he published in what was then the Western Economic Journal, precursor of economic inquiry in 1969 on information costs, which is much less familiar to people than the other two. More surprising to me, Armin said it was, he thought, the best thing he ever done. I was surprised. I was also surprised, however, that the list did not include a single thing on property rights. Not one article on property rights. And yet, if you go, and I document this by going to encyclopedias and economics, etc., if you look up Armin Alchin, what do they say is the most important thing about Armin Alchin? Property rights. And yet, none of his pieces on property rights were included in his own list of what he thought were the three best things he did, including the one thing he thought was the best, which has nothing at all to do with property rights. So that was pretty interesting. Uh, more interesting, and this is now known to some of you, but it was not known to me nor to the world, 
but I'll never forget this. Um, I opened the email or something from him one day, and uh, there is this thing, apropos of nothing. It doesn't relate to any of the articles that we're that we're uh, writing about in the um, in the paper. And he says, "Oh, by the way, I like to think that I was the first person to ever run a financial event study." And he tells the story. It's in my paper, redacted or, or summarized. It's in his article, how while working at Brand, and with everyone knowing that an H-bomb was in the development, and he, Armin, wondering, as an economist at Brand, well, what metal are they going to use in this forthcoming H-bomb? So he goes to the scientists, who, of course, will not tell him anything uh, about this. And so, as as Armin says uh, in his piece, I looked at them and said, okay, don't worry, I'll figure it out. <laughs> so he goes off and he gets the Department of Commerce yearbook and looks at a series of metal companies' stock returns over the period of the year. Right? And it's one company whose stock had just taken off over the year. The American Lithium <coughs> Company. American Lithium Company. So Armin writes a paper, which he circulates at Brand, called The Stock Market Speaks. <laughs> and it's floating around, and he describes what he's done, and he says, and the answer is lithium. <laughs> Later that morning, at Brand, there's a knock on the door, and there are two or three security guys saying, how many copies of this paper have you run off? And where are they? <laughs> and they're all gathered up, and as far as I know, no one has ever seen, I don't think Armin had, I think he even took his. Uh, and this is, of course, way before computers, way before hard disks, so it was, it was gone. But what's amazing is that um, there's, there's more cool stuff, trust me. It's not cool stuff because I put it in there. It's cool stuff because it came from Armin. That's what makes it cool. But it was really cool doing this with it. But he didn't point out, uh, the fact, too, that what he was essentially relying on was, long before the phrase was attached to it, or people who would later win Nobel Prizes for it, called the efficient market hypothesis. This whole thing was based on the efficiency of markets. And what's really cool, I teach, when I teach finance, I teach the efficient market hypothesis. And we all know it's got a weak, a semi-strong, and a strong version. And nobody is willing to put their money behind the, the strong version, all non-public information being reflected in stock prices. Everybody, they say, no, nah, nah, I can't have it. Well, here's an example where this information, believe me, was non-public. It was real non-public. <laughs> it was like, if you knew it, they were going to send somebody around to sit in your office and just keep an eye on you until it became public. And yet, there it was in the stock prices. Armand doesn't even talk about it the efficient market hypothesis implications of what he did. He's only talking methodologically about the event study, but the event study makes no sense unless theoretically markets are <coughs> in some way, in some way. So there's more cool stuff here. Uh, I urge you to read it uh, when it becomes available. Um, another another in, uh, enticement, another blandishment, another reason why you should read this is uh, it's 11 pages. <laughs> okay, so when you've, when you've uh, uh, busted your chops on uh, what Jeff has to say and what have you, and you, you're, you're just feeling like, okay, it's time to take a break, but I'm still in for a little bit of economics. This is, this is what you want. But I hope it sends you back to the, to the original of uh, Armin's, uh, and it, there's a lot of, there's, there's a certain amount of personal material in here which I didn't mind putting in. I'll just I'll just read you the very end of the paper and then I'll, I'll get off the stage. Um, this is the very end of my paper. With our work on the principles reaching an end, he wrote to me, quote, best wishes, and I hardly need say, I appreciate all of your interest and efforts. The appreciation was all mine for a long, long time going all the way back to the mid-1970s when I first 
had the good fortune to come into contact with Armin. Uh, a relationship that, from afar, nonetheless, lasted uh, for a good long time. So, thank you. Thanks. One slight footnote to that. Uh, Armin was very forgetful. And my guess is that when you asked him for three articles, three came to mind and he simply forgot the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and at any rate, we now have uh, a student of Armin's to tell us more about this grandman, Josh Wright. That event study story is my favorite Armin story. Um, so I'm very glad that you, you shared it. Um, there are uh, very few economists where one uh, gets the opportunity to write a reflection has no idea where to, to begin. And I think uh, Armin's, uh, the, the breadth of his work, but also um, the nature of the contribution, so much of it in teaching and with, with the judges. And, outside of the traditional avenues of scholarship that it sort of uh, leaves one uh, you know, with uh, some pause as to, uh, to where to start. Economists of uh, considerable talents and, and, and much more than mine have spent uh, you know, pages and pages uh, talking about Armin's contributions in, in economics. Uh, I think uh, for certain uh, John Lott, who's here in the front row, the 1997 volume on uh, essays in honor of Armin is something anybody interested in Armin's work uh, ought to read, his collected works, and, and, and so forth. Um, in terms of uh, personal reflections, there are others here who uh, have had uh, longer running uh, personal relationships with, uh, the, with Armin than I, I could have had, indeed, relationships that lasted, lasted longer than I've been alive. Um, so, so the struggle to figure out uh, what I could tell you, um, I, was, I was not, I was a student of Armin in the sense that he was, uh, I was his last uh, PhD student. He sat on my, my, my committee. He was done teaching the graduate sequence at UCLA sometime uh, before I showed up uh, in Westwood in 1998. Um, but there are some things I can, I can tell you nonetheless, and I feel um, one of the things that I'm uniquely qualified uh, to talk about, or at least somewhat uniquely, uh, is to talk about uh, Armin's contributions uh, here at Mason, uh, and uh, especially here at Mason and through uh, judicial education. Uh, Armin, I uh, got to UCLA in 1990, 1998, and uh, mentioned was Armin's last PhD student. My dissertation advisor was Ben Klein. Um, and Ben had a, a lot of early work with, with Armin and, and some, some famous papers on the theory of the firm. And I was talking to Ben about uh, who to uh, put on my dissertation committee. And I was, at the time, uh, I liked to, in graduate school, I was a big fan of running uh, the uh, fancy two-step, three-step regressions that the people in the, the economics departments would pay attention to. And there were some, some new economists on the faculty at UCLA. I was thinking, maybe I'll get these guys on my committee. I said, no, your committee is going to be uh, me, Armin, and Harold Demsetz. And I said, oh, OK. You're the, you're the boss. Um, and uh, that sounds good to me. If it, yeah, you're going to learn some economics that way. <laughs> None of this partial derivative stuff they're teaching you in the in the sequences. But at least I'll know you'll learn some economics and you won't embarrass me uh, when, when you're done. So that became my, my committee. And uh, I can say I, I learned more, but Ben was right, I learned more economics uh, listening to uh, each of those three talk to me, most importantly, listening to them argue with each other uh, on, on occasion was an opportunity where I probably learned more economics than, than anything else during graduate school. Uh, or, or, or after. Um, most of my relationship with Armin was uh, an opportunity to, uh, every time I could, I would uh, 
walk around lunch hall, see if he was there, poke my head in the office, um, and, and bother him with, with questions. Uh, usually about how to get Ben to sign my dissertation. Uh, and uh, how to be less scared of Harold in one-on-one -on -one <laughs> and, uh, and he had advice on, on, on both. Um, but we would walk around campus and usually um, Norman, uh, uh, many law professors are fond of, of thinking that they are uh, especially good at the Socratic method. Uh, Armin was a master of the Socratic method. Uh, though I, I, I recall one of the uh, first questions he asked me when uh, we were walking around campus, and I, I think in hindsight this was some sort of IQ test to see if he should bother with me, uh, was uh, asking me about uh, if economics uh, had anything to say about the ratio of men to women distributed through, around, different parts of UCLA's campus. Uh, the answer, I think, is probably uh, best left for the break. Uh, but <laughs> if you are not accounting for the role of the university as marriage market, then you're not getting it right. Um, my my, uh, my second uh, favorite discussion with Armin in that context uh, is uh, Remind me quite a bit of the law firm uh, discussion. My, my economic, my, my dissertation was about the vertical restraints and antitrust and shelf space contracts. Contracts where manufacturers would buy retail shelf space uh, in other promotional efforts. And um, I had a fancy model. I had some empirics. I was uh, ready to go. And uh, when I was starting to work on the project, the very first question uh, that uh, that Armin asked me. I don't, Ben and Harold both, uh, there was not much modeling in any of, of the work. Some of Harold's earlier stuff had, uh, uh, had, had regressions, and he could certainly do it. It was sort of picking the tool for the job. Armin often found the model was not the right tool for the, for the job, but he certainly had the mathematical chops to do it. And he would look at your model and tell you what was wrong with it, um, and then tell you you should do something else. But, but he, would, he, would, he would at least tell you what was wrong with the model. When I talked to, to him about my, my dissertation topic, we had a two-hour discussion, um, not about the model, which is what I, I went there for, but about essentially, well, what the hell do you know about grocery stores, Josh? Um, and, and uh, you know, we, so I started visiting some grocery stores. Uh, and, and that was, I, I think, one of the uh, key, really, really uh, unique things about, about Armin's uh, approach. And, uh, become more popular in, in econometrics later with Freakonomics and so forth, but it was the idea that the economists looked out as a window for topics, um, you know, not to the method first. Uh, and, and that was something that I think um, uh, always mattered to him. Now, uh, I, I want to talk about Armin's influence here at Mason uh, and also uh, a little bit in terms of, of uh, economics on, on the bench and judicial education as a topic of some of my my research, I'll talk about uh, a, a little bit uh, about that. Uh, the influence here, I think, at George Mason is um, some, sometimes underappreciated. So, uh, again, I think I'll, I'll start with a personal tale. I finished my JD at UCLA in 2002, and uh, in 2003, my, my PhD was forthcoming in a couple of months, and uh, like most 20 something year olds, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, maybe an academic, maybe a practicing lawyer, maybe something else altogether. Some of uh, my colleagues in the room uh, know I, I spent a lot of time around that portion of my life doing what I will refer to, because there's a camera in the room, as uh, uh, applied statistical analysis in the uh, 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 rather than uh, writing papers and the like. I passed entirely going on the formal legal job market, um, and it was really a fortuitous connection between the UCLA Economics Department and George Mason, one, one owed to Henry, uh, and the LEC that resulted in the George Mason Hiring Committee learning about, presumably from someone in UCLA who thought I ought to be gambling less, um, <laughs> my, my very strong interest in teaching. To tell you the true, truth, I hadn't heard about it either. Uh, <laughs> But my UCLA advisors, like, like 
my mom wanted me to get a real job. <laughs> so I landed in the fall of uh, 2003 and I came to give my George Mason job talk. The talk was, uh, it was, it was pure economics. It was you know, a model of these shell space contracts. I was very excited to have figured it all out. But it was all economics and, and no law. I thought I had completely crushed the talk. I thought it was great. Um, I, I, I didn't do great. Uh, I missed the point of the exercise nearly entirely. Uh, not understanding uh, some things that I know now about the, the hiring process in law schools. Um, the job talk was an opportunity to figure out whether I was intellectually interesting enough um, for the folks at Mason to want to keep me around. And to answer some crushing questions about whether I was interested enough about the law to teach at a law school. Um, in my case, uh, the question about I, whether I had any real interest in law, I was completely disinterested in answering. Uh, by paper selection, not that I had a choice of other papers to choose from, um, and by most of my answers to questions, which returned the audience to, uh, to the economics, ignore the law, um, I had failed the separate test uh, miserably. The faculty vote came down uh, on a tenure track offer, and I wasn't close to the requisite number of votes. Not even close. <laughs> okay. um, a few law and economics faculty who had managed to hold on some small degree of hope for my prospects as a law professor asked whether the faculty might entertain uh, what we call a, a visiting assistant professor appointment, uh, basically a short tryout where they could cut me uh, if I didn't work out after a year or two. Um, in support of this motion, uh, Bruce uh, Kobayashi, a fellow UCLA uh, economics PhD, assured the faculty the short-term commitment meant exit costs would be low if I was a bust, uh, but that he suspected it would work out fine. Um, I hasten to add, I hasten to add, uh, add that Bruce's defense was not because he thought I was worthy uh, of the uh, full tenure track appointment. He, he did not, uh, and this is something that he reminds me from time to time, uh, <laughs> like every time I see him. Uh, <laughs> rather, Bruce's support came, and he announced to uh, the, the committee and the, the faculty at the time, because, quote, he's a Bruin. <laughs> no, no other explanation. Those of you who know Bruce, you've heard him say it before in hiring uh, meetings from time to time, it will be okay because Quote, he's a Bruin. Con law faculty would look at Bruce strangely, also something that happens with uh, some frequency. And <laughs> he would say, uh, not altogether sure what it, what it meant, but it meant something uh, to Bruce, and it turned out that it means something uh, here at, at George Mason, and indeed uh, got me that short term trial, which I managed not to bumble entirely. Um, and it is uh, that connection, the one that made uh, being a Bruin. Uh, something special at Mason, um, uh, and it's a connection born uh, of, of Armin that I want to explore uh, a, a little bit more. Um, having already confessed that, that I owe my job to this connection, uh, it is, I think, worth pointing out some, some obvious things and maybe some less obvious uh, things about that connection. Uh, by the time that I got here in 2000, uh, in four, or shortly after the time I got here, by the time uh, Professor Hazlitt showed up, uh, there were at least uh, four Bruin uh, economists, or, or, or close to economists, uh, include uh, Tim Muris, who had, uh, got his undergraduate education at UCLA under, under Arvin. Uh, there were at least four Bruins on a faculty of low 30s, uh, uh, a fairly good uh, representation. And if you uh, account for the number of other economists that came from a tradition similar that UCLA would have been happy to have, uh, the number was, was, was much, much higher. Um, so, so why so many damn Bruins in Arlington um, is, is a question uh, that comes to mind. And I think in Henry's open remarks, he gets at, at some of it, I think this is one of the underappreciated points about just how deeply the UCLA school and the UCLA approach, and by that I mean Armin's approach, uh, uh, to price theory and to microeconomics generally was embedded into the intellectual DNA of, of this school. And I suspect um, that the driving factor in that uh, was at the inception and has continued to be a relationship between Armin and Henry. Um, and that UCLA approach, I think it's you know, difficult to uh, 
you know, sort of encapsulate in a, in a t-shirt slogan. But if one were going to try um, to compare to some other approaches, like maybe uh, people, you know, Chicago School of Price Theory or some such, um, was, you know, a rigorous application of price theory, not only like Chicago School of uh, Price Theory, but with a special emphasis on property rights uh, and institutions. And I think, um, Henry him, him himself, and we'll, we'll, we'll get him in the, in, in the comments, I would say that probably most of the economics he's applied in his work um, follow that approach more than, um, more than any other. And I would speculate that it is uh, the uniqueness of Armin's approach um, you know, embraced, taught to and embraced by, by, by Henry and spread through uh, George Mason that has uh, made uh, that link uh, such an important structural part of the intellectual foundation uh, here at Mesa. A short comment on uh, judicial education. Uh, I do uh, uh, antitrust most of the time in my, my research and, and for a living, uh, and Armin liked to uh, teach antitrust to the judges. He had, uh, over, over 50% of most of these programs, and uh, you know, often I think it would be three or four full days in a row uh, that he would have in his teaching materials as a volume. Uh, you know, most of it is, is adapted from, from university economic hundreds and hundreds of pages, probably 20, 25 pages of material uh, where he would go from teaching firm pricing and price discrimination and shift over uh, uh, to, to uh, predation comes up over and over again. And he liked to use the example uh, predatory pricing cases where we got their all-time high in antitrust jurisprudence um, in uh, the late 70s and, and, and early 80s. And I want to give two an anecdotal accounts of uh, Armin's influence uh, on uh, the judges. And these are two anecdotal accounts for which we have uh, good public evidence and suggest that for this uh, narrow 20 pages to have this sort of influence it might give some sense of, of uh, the real effects that, that, that Armin had on the federal bench on the output of, of their work. For this part, and because I see a camera on me still, I'm going to say that the things that I say now do not reflect the views of any other commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission. <laughs> <laughs> One judge had publicly stated that he had written, uh, but not published, an antitrust opinion involving allegations of predatory pricing uh, before attending an LEC program. After attending and gaining a better understanding of pricing and the concept of marginal costs, the judge uh, set aside a $15 million in 1978, a $15 million verdict, <coughs> in a sophisticated opinion explaining with footnote material with pictures depicting uh, cost curves and all, why average cost was a poor proxy for marginal cost in an industry with excess capacity. There is a carefully uh, drawn curves in, in the footnotes, footnote 7, if, if, if I recall, and an excited letter to the LEC explaining uh, uh, what he had done uh, in, in the opinion. The second example comes from a textbook hypothetical in Army's teaching materials. Any antitrust lawyer would quick, quickly recognize as a stylized version of the facts in Matsushita versus Zenith. Famous antitrust cases involving allegations of, of uh, so-called collusive uh, predatory pricing. Uh, collusion in Japan, build a war chest to predate in the United States, was the theory. Alchin quickly scolds readers who would conclude, I'm going to quote from the materials a bit, uh, incorrectly that Japanese producers and customers are subsidizing U.S. customers by selling at prices below cost, reminding them that, quote, you'd have to conclude the Japanese producers were being deliberately charitable to U.S. customers if you believe that subsidization story. He then turns to the economics. Instead, every unit is covering the cost of production. The lower price units, like the higher priced ones, each bring marginal revenues that exceed their associated marginal costs. The American customers are delighted. Within the U.S., the objectors are those who own resources and sources of income, specialized to the manufacture of the domestic products competing uh, with imports. With the specific example came more general skepticism about the likelihood of success of a predation strategy in the conclusion that below-cost selling as a predatory tactic is not as smart as it appears to be. And what about Matsushima versus Zenith? The case is well known in antitrust circles primarily for its holding with respect to the evidence plaintiffs required to proffer in order to avoid summary judgment to show a conspiracy. 
but it's also long been a, case, a critical case in modern predatory pricing jurisprudence. The district court judge who wrote the opinion before his promotion to the Third Circuit, the opinion ultimately held by the Supreme Court in that important case, was an LEC student. The opinion bears uh, throughout it Armin's signature style, uh, signature, uh, largely university economic style. These two vignettes illustrate uh, not just Armin's influence in, in, in those two cases, but how he helped discipline uh, a paradoxical and incoherent uh, legal area. Armin's lessons on cost and pricing, competition, and monopoly were shared with hundreds of judges. Uh, some of my work with Mike Bay uh, suggests that, no doubt attributable uh, in large part uh, to Armin's teaching on the federal judiciary, that the effect of the LEC training on the judiciary has been remarkably positive uh, in antitrust cases. We examined federal cases, all of the federal cases, between 96 and 2006. Nearly all of the judges deciding those cases appointed, uh, excuse me, uh, appointed during the time uh, when, when Armin uh, was teaching, controlling for a variety of other things than one of these fancy multiple regressions. Um, we found that LEC training resulted in a significant reduction in appeals and, and reversal rates. Indeed, basic economic training, which in our sample meant a series of those of Arna, uh, had a greater impact on appeal and reversal rates uh, than a marginal increase in judicial experience in cases. In fact, a uh, much greater impact on reducing appeal and reversal rates than had the judge had the opportunity to decide five or six of these cases. Uh, apparently, early LEC efforts to train FTC staff this is why I did the disclaimer, uh, were not quite as successful. <laughs> Subsequent research shows uh, that even untrained federal district court judges outperform the commission by these same measures. I must therefore conclude that even Armin's brilliance has some limits, uh, unless I comment on my current or prior colleagues. These conclusions uh, provide hope for those dev devoted uh, to the institution of the general's judge. Uh, but skeptical of individual judicial capabilities. Uh, even exposure to basic training can have a profoundly positive uh, impact on, on incomes. Credit is often given for the turnaround in antitrust law uh, to the Supreme Court and to prominent judges in the courts of appeals, and appropriately so, judges such as uh, Bork, Easterbrook, Ginsburg, and Posner uh, for the economic revolution in antitrust law. Given the quantity, over 600 judges uh, by one count, and quality of Armin's interactions with the federal bench. However, it would be mistake, uh, mistake not to recognize his subtle uh, but profound influence uh, on, that, on that field. Uh, a very brief closing uh, uh, remark that uh, sort of a, a note to close with, with some uh, optimism. Uh, when, I, when I got to UCLA in 1998, in the first year of microsequence, about 80% of our class were uh, uh, graduate students from foreign universities, in the case of UCLA, uh, largely from, uh, from Asian nations. And uh, one of the, the big guns on our faculty, the professor who was the chair of the department, chair of the department was named the Armin Alchin chair. Um, and and uh, I knew who that was. I was there because I knew who that was. Uh, but you would hear people, uh, you know, everybody very excited to go to the lecture of this uh, fancy micro theory lecturer who is the, the Alchin chair. Um, and I remember sitting in that class and thinking I was in the wrong place because some of the first year uh, graduate students said, well, uh, who is this Alchin guy? Um, <laughs> that the chair is named, named after um, maybe some uh, 18th century famous economist or <laughs> some, some such. Um, on a recent trip in my current job as a, a commissioner, I go to China and I'll get the opportunity to go out there and give talks. And I gave a talk... Um, Goodness, it felt a lot like giving my first job talk at Mason. I, uh, we got to the Q&A, and I thought, yeah, I don't, I don't think this went as well as I, as I thought. Uh, <laughs> none of the questions were on the topic. Maybe something was lost in translation. Who knows? About 10 minutes into a 20-minute Q&A, uh, graduate student economics in Beijing uh, says, I understand you are a student of the great Armin <laughs> Um What was that like? What was Armin like? Um, what was it like uh, to be his student? And you could see from the uh, graduate economics contingent in the room, uh, people's ears perked up, Federal Trade Commission, who cares? <laughs> Guy knows Alchin. <laughs> and and, and Alchin was a rock star. Um, and I, I think that was, um, 
the happiest moment I think I've had for the, uh, the future of economics uh, in, in some time. And, uh, I think that is an appropriate note to close on. Thank you. Discussions of these three papers, we had more Bruins. <laughs> Dan Benjamin and Bruce Kobayashi. I may have seen. Dan? Okay. So, uh, first I need to say thank you to Henry for doing this and for having me. And I just want to Don Martin, thanks to him for having me read University, University Economics and sending me off to UCLA. Uh, Armin Alshin's intellectual life began on the Fresno River. Uh, on Saturday, when the weather was fair and no family obligations intruded, his father would launch him on the river on a homemade raft with an agreement to pick him up later in the day downstream. Armin would spend the day drifting downstream, eating watermelon and thinking. When asked later what he thought about, he said quite simply, anything, everything. Thus began an intellectual life of inquiry into the mysteries of human behavior. Arvid's known to economists as an intellectual innovator and, and as a ruthless debunker. Uh, but, but I was struck by Fred's devotion uh, to his teaching because it was a talent and passion of Arvid uh, that I came to cherish in the years I knew him. Armin's approach to problems with a method of attack well characterized by Susan Woodward, one of his co-authors on several occasions, and she said, and I quote, and I love the quote, the Alshin approach is, oh, here's an idea. Let's walk around the idea and see what it looks like from all of the sides. Let's tip it over and see what's under it and what kind of noise it makes when you turn it over. Let's lay a fire under it and see what happens. Drop it ten stories. <laughs> This methodology, which was the dominating feature of discourse with Armin, is sometimes lost in the polish of his papers. But it was an approach that could not be avoided by his students, his colleagues, and even, according to George Stigler, by his golfing partner. As a survivor of three of Armin's classes, I can attest that Josh was exactly right when he said that Armin was the was master of the Socratic method. Indeed, he was an exhilarating and terrifying master of the classroom. Each day, he dissected another part of the world and the ideas of us and others in front of the class. As one whose ideas were routinely set on fire and dropped again stories, it was a transformative experience. But after the shock of one's own intellectual inadequacy wore off, it was profoundly reassuring. If a notion survived Alshin's scrutiny, it would withstand any inquiry. Lest I paint too harsh a picture of Armin the Inquisitor, let me emphasize that Fred has perfectly captured the spirit of Armin's dialogue with the students. He said, Fred said, more stunning was his genuine interest in what I proposed, my economic thinking behind it, and especially his great patience throughout our conversation. I thought to myself that Armin seemed actually to enjoy our exchange, to hear what I was thinking. Indeed, Armin listened intently even when it was first-year graduate students who were doing the talking. And he never hesitated to modify his, his thinking when he was confronted with superior reasoning or facts, which didn't happen often with first-year graduate students. But he was willing to learn from errors, whether they were his own or someone else's. And I want to illustrate this with his own writings on the theory of the firm here. Uh, Collectively, Armin's papers on the theory of the firm have garnered more than 20,000 citations. Almost half of these citations are to later papers by Armin that explain why his classic article with Demsets on the theory of the firm was wrong. And that actually, although wrong is not a word Armin uses in print, he used it with me many times. And he explains in the papers why he thinks that he and Demsets got it wrong. And the general point is, he came to believe that, that, the, that the essence of the firm was, was not teamwork. The essence of the firm was a network, a nexus of contracts that, that were strained transactions. Armin's writings on the firm are sufficiently sensitive to fill a modest-sized book. The entirety of this work, spanning almost 20 years, makes it possible to glimpse the evolutionary nature of Armin's work, because his thinking on this topic 
changed over time as he learned more and more. But this, this, this research also reflects the fact that many of Armin's most important works can be traced to a very simple idea, the notion, the notion that information is costly to acquire and disseminate. This simple notion that, e that information should be treated as a scarce good like other scarce goods had a profound impact uh, on the literature, and Armin was one of the very first proponents of this idea. Jeff and Todd focused their comments on Armin's very first published professional paper on uncertainty. Armin wrote this paper not for publication, but simply to help himself and his students understand what was going on. Once the paper was published, however, it brought an entire line of inquiry in economics to a grinding halt. Economists had been, had been running around trying to figure out how do people really think. You firm really maximize profit. Armin's paper made it perfectly clear that this mattered not at all. What mattered was people's behavior. It was their behavior that we can observe, and it was their behavior that determined the outcomes of their decisions. As many as Wiki abundantly make clear, and I must admit I say this with some jealousy, <laughs> by the, way, the unambiguous implication of the paper, of Armand's paper published in 1950, is that the fast and growing modern literature on behavioral economics is much ado about almost nothing. Okay? And, I, and I hope, my, way, my chief complaint with the paper is that you guys are not harsh enough and don't take it far enough, <laughs> and so I encourage you to do more with this. I really believe, as you know, Armand's, that paper by Armand, means that all this whack-a-mole we're playing with the behavioral economics stuff it, it is so much sound and fury signifying nothing. I will also, I, I do find myself complain about Manion's wiki because I think they're too easy on the regulators. Chain like you, okay? And, and in particular, I think they wait too long in the paper to, to note uh, that taken as a body, the work of Alshin, Bork, and Buchanan, imply that regulators must be presumed to be inferior, produce outcomes inferior to the market, and that, that, that the burden of proof for any contrary proposition must lie with the proponents thereof. Uh, Armin is generally regarded as being the founder, along with Ronald Coase and Harold Demsetz, as the founders of the economic study of property rights. Uh, his earliest work on property rights was written in the 1950s, when there was literally no other, e no other economic literature on this. I want to briefly tell a story about the origins of this. He, Armin and Bill Meckley were at RAND at this time, uh, and they were doing some work with the engineers at RAND. Armin was particularly interested in cost of the production. And they couldn't get the engineers to cooperate with them, to tell, us, tell them technical issues uh, that they needed to know about, because the engineers felt like they wouldn't get credit in their home park. Uh, so, Action mechanically spent hours and hours and hours to see if they could devise some system by which the engineers would get points uh, uh, for working with them that would somehow cap with their home department. But they eventually came to the conclusion that unless those points could be traded for other valuable goods, <coughs> they were fundamentally worthless. And it was this inquiry that led to Armin's early emphasis. I mean, economists had known the restraints on trade, uh, that, that restrictions on trade were costly. But this experience in trying to figure out how to induce engineers to help economists, it was what led Armin to focus so much of his work on property rights on the importance of exchangeability of property rights in ensuring that those rights would get and stay in their highest value use. Uh, it also helped Armin think about government and nonprofit organizations. Also, work begun in the 1950s, about the same time that Buchanan and Tulloch were working to formulate some of their key work. Prior to this, prior to the 1950s, the standard treatment of government was to assume that basically the goal was to maximize some sort of social welfare function, to do the right thing for the right reasons. Nonprofit organizations were modeled similarly or simply ignored. Buchanan and Alshin revolutionized this literature by recognizing that all decisions are made by individuals. Although the wealth maximization objective was explicitly suppressed for governments and nonprofits, individual decision making could not be. 
Hence, they analyze the actions of entities as resulting from the constrained choices of individuals who populated them. Buchanan obviously played a greater role in this endeavor, but what made Armin's contribution so Alshin-esque was his focus on making the utility maximization hypothesis operational. The crucial element was to discern how and why constraints change, and then simply to use basic economic principles to trace out the consequences of those changes in constraints. In Armin's view, economic theory must always confront and conform to the facts. It must yield refutable implications. And if these are the if these are refuted, it is the theory, not the facts, which must be used. Despite Armin's formidable intellectual presence, he was fundamentally kind, shy, compassionate, and humble. And he was a quiet but passionate champion of liberty. He showed me and countless others, including a few people in this room, the beauty and power of economics and demonstrated through his actions that both could be transmitted in the classroom and through the written word. The science of economics was a richer discipline because of Armin's prodigious intellect. More importantly, the world's a better place because he graced us with his wisdom, his kindness, and his love of liberty. With his passing, economics lost a powerful force. We lost the man who exemplified the best of what humans can be.
Uh, it turns out I could have invented the MP3 player. <laughs> well, anyways, uh, it was always much more interesting, and so I took intermediate macro microeconomics. Uh, as, a, as an undergraduate, I was an engineer, but uh, I decided, well, it was interesting. And I had this guy, Alshin, and I said, oh, he's, he's, he's the guy that, that wrote this book, and uh, it was great because I didn't have to, it was the same book. <laughs> and, uh, it was very interesting. I mean, you know, instead of sort of deriving, um, you know, indifference curves and all that, it was, you know, questions like, why did the good oranges get shipped out of state? <laughs> uh, and uh, Armin actually was, you know, UCLA is a pretty safe place. It's, you know, West LA and Belarus to the north. I mean, he, he got those cost me that life because uh, <coughs> the reason I took Armin's class wasn't anything, you know, noble or sensible, it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 10 o'clock. And uh, he had a test every Friday, so it was really just Monday and Wednesday. And uh, so by, by about the ninth week, I had done so well, and, and you know, you like stuff, you do well at, that um, I had so many points that uh, the person next to me, I, I, I could have just not come anymore and not taken the final, I would have had the most points. So Alchin is calculating it, and he said, Bruce Kobayashi, come see me after class. I'm an 18 year old, you know, freshman, uh, sophomore. And, and I said, well, what did I do? And he said, oh, no, I'm going to tell the class this guy has gotten so many points that even if he gets a zero on the final, that he'll still get the highest grade in the class. So you don't have to come anymore. And there was this large person sitting next to me. And he looked at me and he goes, I'd like to kill that son of a bitch. <laughs> and so I walked out. This is the first time I ever talked to Armin Elton. And, and I, I snuck out the back way. And he was walking toward Bunch Hall. And I said, really, I don't have to come anymore? I really don't have to show up for the final? And he looked at me and, and gave me that smile, which meant that, you idiot. Um, but he smiled. And he goes, come if you want. I don't care. But if you care... It, it's not going to affect your grade because, well, if you get a zero, whether you come or don't come, you're still going to have the highest grade in the class. Um, and so, um, you know, it was it was such a revelation that you know this is something I could be good at, and it's interesting. And it really is uh, one of the things that uh, if they had, you know, what what they have now in, in economics departments, including UCLA, as an adjunct or, you know, some senior lecturer or somebody who really doesn't care or doesn't know as much, I, you know, I might have, you know, been rich and invented the MP3. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the, Did you go to the uh, I didn't go to the fine. I went to the last one. <laughs> but I was still nervous. Actually, I remember getting the, the card and I said, I wonder, you know, I don't know if I trust this. I'll <laughs> And of course, I, I, I was an end, so Josh is really the end of the era of the, the sort of old school UCLA economics, but, but my class, an undergraduate class, was the last class that had uh, the sort of lineup of Jack Hirschleifer, Finus Welch, and Armin Elgin. After that, they got some mathematicians um, to, uh, to, to um, get in, but uh, our year, we had this odd thing where Jack Hirschleifer and Elgin switched. So uh, Hirschleifer taught the first semester of price theory, and Elgin taught uh, capital theory. Of course, he used his book, and it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, by the time we got to Elgin, everybody had heard about Elgin, and we had, were, you know, seasoned, you know, graduate students. And he came in and he said, all right, somebody give me a theorem. And of course, we had already gone through two, you know, UCLA was not a fuzzy place. So we had gone, already been through two quarters of beatings at the hands of our professors. So everybody's like, no, well, not me. And so he goes into his wallet and he pulls out 20 bucks. This is in 1981. And he said, 20 bucks for a theorem. Come on, somebody. And nobody says, no, not worth 20 bucks. And finally he said, 20 bucks for a theorem and 20 bucks for, for the proof. And I remember... Steve Feinstein, guy with red hair, um, transferred to Yale right after this. Um, <laughs> raised his hand, and Elgin smiled at him, which meant, what an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> said, okay, Mr. Feinstein, give me your theorem. And he, the poor guy says, 
demand curve slope downwards, and you know there, there was an audible groan from the back of the room. Because <laughs> that's, that's not a theorem as well. And he spent you know 45 minutes proving that gift of you know, given goods. And Steve Einstein, I remember he had red hair because his face was as red as, as his hair at the end of it. But he got the 20 bucks, not the 40. Um, <laughs> it really was sort of a, 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 an experiential training that, you know, what is UCLA economics? Well, it's, it's sort of going through a beat. But you, you build character and you learn. And so, you know, you know, that's really what it means to be a Bruin, right? It's, you were beating a lot of students. <laughs> uh, the, the, the question is then, why, why did I take four classes from Marvin? Uh, the, the, the third class was uh, industrial organization. Harold was, I still can't call him Harold. Professor Demsitz was um, off at Wash U, so he actually taught um, the IO sequence with Ben Klein. Uh, and the last one was really odd because he, he was on the schedule for a special topics class. It was called Special Topics in Economics by Alshin. And I went and I said, oh, look, it's a new book. <laughs> no, it's just a new edition of the same old one I had in Econ 1. <laughs> but, uh, so I went to Armin and I said, uh, you know, um, you think I'm going to get anything out of this class? Um, given that I, you know, this is my fourth time through the same stuff. And he looked at me and smiled at me, which meant, you're an idiot. But, um, <laughs> he goes, well, the questions are the same. Answers are different. <laughs> 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 which, uh, you know, is really what Dan said in a different way. is that, you know, okay, we had some, you know, I mean, you have to shake the problem, you have to turn it over, you have to drop it. And, and you, you, you maybe turned it over, but you haven't dropped it yet or lit it on fire. And uh, it was just sort of that intellectual way of, of thinking about it that I think explains why UCLA economists do so well in law school. Um, and uh, because their, their method of inquiry and just their inquisitiveness, and, and especially the ones that uh, went through Armin Alchin, is a good way to sort of think about all kinds of things, including law. Um, so the last thing is, is I, I told Todd because Todd was tardy, not as tardy as Josh. I read Josh's thing this morning. So. But uh, I, I had this whole thing where I was going to talk about a reference Fred's thing about the Nobel Prize, and, and uh, you know, I'm going to make this clever thing about John List, you know, which, which uh, Jeff and, and Todd talk about. You know, John List, is, Becker said, John List is going to win the Nobel Prize based on his work on field experiments. And one of the field experiments, he said, you know, if you get people with market experiences, all of this prospect theory, this difference between willingness to accept and willingness to pay, goes away. And if you get people you know, who are inexperienced and you basically give them some experience, it goes away too. And it really is sort of a, a strike at the heart if you sort of couple that with Alton's uh, 1950 evolution paper. You know, at, at the importance, as Dan said, of, of behavioral economics. And um, especially in settings like antitrust, which is all market. Right? If, if some guys fail because they're doing something stupid, that's good. Right? It's not a bad thing. <laughs> and, and so, um, and going back to sort of you know, getting that to that and, and you know, the UCLA economics department, everything's sort of teaching you. You know, the UCLA economics sort of embodied Alchin's 50 papers in the sense that you know, there are you know, 20, 24 guys and they say, look around you, most of you won't be here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, it really was, you know, a, a reminder that the institution matter and, and, and selection, right, although, you know, it's bad news for some people, um, is really an important part of the institution of markets. Uh, so, um, on that, I'll close. I hope you all agree with me that uh, we've enjoyed a unique experience this morning. It will continue, but it occurs to me it probably couldn't occur in any other law school in the world. Uh, and the accidents of my early acquaintance with Armin, Harold Demsetz, Buchanan, and the others is, I guess, what history is made of. Uh, <clears throat> at any rate, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. We have a break now of 15 minutes. <laughs>